So you take again, non-dualistic pantheism, God as an impersonal something, substance, principle, and you take reincarnation, especially the karma part of it, and the two do not cohere. And this is a necessary test of any worldview. Do their leading principles, do their key beliefs cohere logically? Hi there, welcome to the Carpenter's Desk. I'm Asher John, and today I'm glad to have with me the American philosopher, Dr. Douglas Grotius. Uh, Dr. Douglas Grotius is a professor of philosophy at Denver Seminary. Previously, he has served as an adjunct professor at Seattle Pacific University, a visiting instructor in apologetics for Westminster Theological Seminary and an instructor at the University of Oregon. He is a member of the Evangelical Theological Society, the Evangelical Philosophical Society, and the Society of Christian Philosophers. He has authored several books, including Walking Through Twilight, A Wife's Illness, A Philosopher's Lament, A Philosophy in Seven Sentences, Christian Apologetics, A Comprehensive Case for Christian Faith, which, is, which I think is, is a wonderful textbook for apologetics that you must have on your shelf and also Unmasking the New Age. I'll leave a link to some of his publications in the description. He's also written for scholarly journals such as Religious Studies, Research in Philosophy and Technology, the Journal, for the, uh, the journal of the Evangelical Theological Society and Philosophy at Christi, as well as for numerous popular magazines such as Christianity Today and Moody Magazine. I'm thrilled to have you on Dr. Gortais, welcome. I'm happy to be here, thank you. I hope I am pronouncing your last name correctly. It's close enough. All right. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, so I think that we have a wonderful discussion or a conversation lined up today, um, uh, which is on reincarnation and karma, two fundamental doctrines that are present in Eastern religions particularly, but today also in the New Age movement about which Dr. Grotias has written extensively. And uh, it is indeed our, you know, a pleasure to have him on today. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. But while I'm, while you guys are at it, you know, you may also want to check out our playlist conversations at the desk. If you really enjoy such conversations, do check out the playlist and subscribe and tap the bell icon to get notifications when a new content is up. So, Dr. Gratis, um, you know, this is a very vast issue, and you have, you know, written about this particularly. I really enjoyed um, it, your chapter on the problem of evil. Uh, I've read several things on the problem of evil, but you know what, what I really liked about that chapter is that you go across the worldviews and you see how different worldviews respond to the problem of evil. But let's begin by defining the terms, right? How do we, you know, could you just define and describe the doctrine of karma and reincarnation as understood particularly in the Eastern religions? Yes, karma is the idea that you in a sense, reap what you sow, that's biblical language. The Bible doesn't teach karma, but the notion is that your good works in one life will be rewarded in the next, and your bad works in one life will be punished in the next. And this keeps going until you leave the cycle of reincarnation entirely. So the goal in Hinduism and Buddhism and their sense of karma is not to come back for a better life, let's say a more wealthy or healthier life, but to leave what's called the wheel of samsara, the wheel of suffering, and to attain nirvana, uh, which is not anything like the biblical view of paradise. It's a place where you are extinguished. You have no good karma, you have no bad karma, and you have escaped the world of time, space, matter, and personality entirely. So one way of putting it is that karma is the moral engine of reincarnation. A reincarnation involves not only people, but all forms of life, all forms of sentient life. So it could include animals as well as people. Right. 
Um, so, uh, I mean, there you have a, already a distinction between the idea of karma and reincarnation. And because sometimes I think people just uh, look at the idea of the, the biblical idea of reap what you sow and mix it with karma. I've seen that. So thank you for, you know, uh, making that distinction clear. Now, these views have um, also gained much popularity in the West, right? Um, why do you think it's, I've heard even we have phrases like instant karma, right? Why do you think people find these ideas of karma and reincarnation very appealing? I think they're appealing because they have a sense that the universe has a moral meaning to it. So if you are evil and you get away with it in this life, you'll be punished in the next. Or if you're a very good person in this life and you are not rewarded for it, that you could be rewarded in the next life. So it gives a sense that there are moral outcomes eventually, even though we don't see those outcomes properly distributed in this lifetime. Now, it's interesting, you have this phrase of instant karma, and you can even see videos online of so-called instant karma, where let's say someone is very nasty on the road, and then right after that, they get into a car accident, something like that. But in Hinduism, karma builds up in a life, and it doesn't have its effect till the next lifetime. So if instant karma <clears throat> really isn't a part of mainstream Hinduism or Buddhism. But the term is very common now. In fact, I went to a restaurant in Boulder, Colorado, and they did not take credit cards. And I didn't uh, have any cash. And they said, we'll give you the karma envelope. And I said, what's that? And they said, well, we leave it to you to pay when you get home, send us a check. If you do, it's good karma. And if you don't, it's bad karma. And I said, well, I don't believe in karma. <laughs> I said, I'll send you a check, but I don't believe in karma. So what I did is I wrote an essay <clears throat> on karma and the gospel of Jesus and put it in the envelope with my check. So I never want to miss a good apologetics opportunity. <laughs> That's wonderful. That's wonderful. So you have argued, you know, even in some of the articles that I read and I'll also when you're addressing the problem of evil, that there are some serious logical flaws and contradictions in the non-dualistic and pantheistic interpretations of karma and reincarnation. So could you kind of survey us through these arguments, probably one by one, we can take that up. And why? what are the logical flaws and contradictions that you see in this world? Good. Well, yeah, you mentioned a pantheistic and non-dualistic view. So that's the view that Everything is divine, and God is not a personal creator designer who is distinct from the universe, but God is, uh, for Hinduism, Brahman, this universal energy or substance. And that's all that there is. So instead of there being a division or distinction between the creator and the creation, all there is is Brahman. There's nothing else. So uh, there are no individual people places, things, everything is one. It's called monism, or another way of putting it is non-dual. So there's no uh, subject-object relationship. We seem to be two people interacting, but if we were both truly enlightened according to non-dualistic pantheism, we would realize that we were one and we were one with everything. Now, when you take that idea and you combine it with karma and reincarnation, it generates a logical contradiction. Because to have reincarnation, you have to have individual souls that leave bodies at death and then re-inhabit another body in the next life and then take on whatever karmic debt or reward is appropriate. Now, if everything is one, and there's no distinction between me and you and us and the planet and the planet and God, then there's no soul, there's no individual entity that is available to be reincarnated, or you might say recycled. So when you take pantheistic non-dualism and you put karma and reincarnation together, it generates a logical contradiction. It doesn't work. 
And there's another problem here too, because as I mentioned in pantheism, you don't want to think of monotheism. That is, there's one God who created, designed, and governs the universe and who is distinct from the universe. That's the teaching of the Bible. You know, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But there's no such distinction. And the God of pantheism is not a personal being. So God reveals himself to Moses in Exodus 3 as I am who I am. So a cognizant ego, a being, an agent who does things. That's not the God of pantheistic non-dualism. So if you don't have a personal being who is evaluating and administering karma, then there's no way that karma could work because it, the system is very complicated. You have every living being that has ever existed and each lifetime plays out their karmic destiny. So you have a lot of data to keep track of, if you will, a lot of moral evaluations. And then on the basis of these evaluations, you have to administer that this person gets this kind of life and this person maybe uh, comes back as a rat and this rat comes back as a frog, but there's no one there in the control room. There's no one there to evaluate the deeds, to tally up the good karma and the bad karma, and then to administer the karmic outcomes. So you take again, non-dualistic pantheism, God as an impersonal something, substance, principle, and you take reincarnation, especially the karma, part of it, and the two do not cohere. And this is a necessary test of any worldview. Do their leading principles, do their key beliefs cohere logically? And these do not cohere. So if we look at a pantheistic, non-dualistic account of reincarnation at the most fundamental level of logical coherence, it is incoherent. It does not work. Yeah, I mean, I think one thing that uh, Hinduism does is that, or even Buddhism is that, it takes a lot of things axiomatically. And I've, I've noticed that even when you're talking to Hindus, particularly in India, these things are assumed and they're not, you know, subjected to the kind of um, test, so to speak, of logical coherency that uh, perhaps in the West we do. And I think you know you've brilliantly pointed out that out one that uh, anyway this non-dualistic framework does not allow for individual souls, and second there is a problem of, of evaluating and administering karma. Um, so we've addressed the non-dualistic framework of Hinduism, but then there's also this dualistic and theistic forms of Hinduism that acknowledge the existence of a personal God. So you have a, maybe an administrator in that sense, and individual souls. So do you think that even such a framework or such a view of Hinduism or Eastern world views um, would still contain logical flaws? Yes, I think there's still difficulties. If you claim that there is an intelligent creator and designer distinct from the universe who is a personal being, that that then that then that kind of being could certainly uh, evaluate and administer karma. So you don't have the flaw at the level of logical coherence on that particular worldview. But that doesn't mean that worldview is true because coherence is a necessary test for the truth of a worldview, but it's not sufficient to ground the worldview. So if you have, let's say, Hindu <clears throat> theism, you have to compare that with biblical theism. And when you talk about biblical theism, you have lots of historical evidence that God revealed himself specifically to the Jews, that he's revealed in nature, and that he is revealed in the most profound way in the person of Jesus Christ as the way, the truth, and the life. So 
sure, theistic versions of, of Hinduism that have individual souls and a creator are coherent. They could generate a coherent idea of reincarnation. But then you have to ask, is that the proper form, the most rational form of theism? And one of the biggest problems on this is on theistic understandings of reincarnation, you still work out this karmic system so you eventually attain salvation. Now, biblically, God is perfectly holy and just, and human beings are not. So human beings are all affected by the fall into sin we see in Genesis 3, and which is explained more in Romans 3 in so many passages. So scripture says, through the works of the law, no one can attain salvation, that is reconciliation with their creator. Or you could put it this way, through good karma, no one will be saved, because yeah. our righteousness before God is like filthy rags, Isaiah says. So even though you've got a coherent system in theistic Hinduism, with respect to karma and reincarnation, you still have to ask, well, who is God? Is God such that there's some kind of a long-term system where you could attain or achieve salvation? And according to the teaching of Scripture, the whole Scripture, and especially of Jesus, that is not possible. And one of the big differences also between Hinduism and Christianity is that Hinduism doesn't really emphasize God's actions in history uh, in terms of uh, sending prophets who lived in real places in, at real times. And we have that in Scripture. God sends prophets. He anoints kings. He speaks of the coming anointed one, the Messiah. And we have very well-attested documents to that. With the New Testament, we have the four Gospels written by four different authors. We have the letters of Peter and Paul and so on. We have the book of Acts about the early church. So on the biblical worldview, God created the universe and he created history. And he's involved in the space-time matter world. He reveals himself and he offers forgiveness and redemption and reconciliation. So Christianity explains our moral condition and the way to be forgiven in a very different way than really any form of Hinduism, uh, theistic, pantheistic, polytheistic, any form. Thank you. That was a wonderful answer there. And what I, what I really liked is your comparison between the biblical idea of God and the idea of God that you see in Hinduism and Eastern religions. And you mentioned that the God of the Bible is holy and just. Do you think that you know maybe when you take something like the moral argument for God and the what the the personal being that you deduce from the moral argument, uh, it exclusively points to the idea of God that is projected in Christianity. Well, it depends on how you frame the moral argument. Uh, the moral argument says that. There are objective moral truths concerning right and wrong and moral duty and virtues and vices. You have a very carefully stated and popular presentation of this in book one of Mere Christianity. And I give a moral argument in my book, Christian Apologetics. But the moral argument doesn't tell you everything you need to know about God. It does say that God is a personal lawgiver and that we are accountable to God. But the moral argument in and of itself does not tell us that God is the Trinity, that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but it's compatible with the Trinity. There's nothing in the moral argument that is against the Trinity, and it doesn't really tell us the way of salvation. We need to go to the Gospel in the New Testament, the whole Bible actually, to find that, but it does tell us that there is an objective moral law based on the character of a lawgiver, that we are accountable to God. And as C.S. Lewis says, that's when Christianity starts to talk to us because 
we realize that we've fallen short of the moral law. He says the moral law is hard as nails and you cannot excuse yourself before an infinitely personal and holy and just God. So I use the moral argument as part of a overall case for Christian theism or what's called a cumulative case. So you have cosmological arguments, design arguments, moral arguments, arguments for the reliability of the New Testament, of the deity of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, the atoning work of Christ on the cross. But it's an important piece. Right. And, you know, the biblical worldview gives meaning to the idea of morality in history. Because the God who is the source of right and wrong is, or, or tells us what right and wrong is on the basis of his character, is a, a self-reflective personal being. So we don't believe, as with karma, that the universe just plays out automatically according to some karmic system. There is a evaluating, administering God who is a God of, of justice and holiness and love. God so loved the world, he sent his son. And the son so loved the father and us that he consented. He did not equ- count equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself and offered himself to atone for, this, for the sins of the world so we could be restored and forgiven. So I'm referring there to John 3.16 and Philippians 2, 5 through 11 to make that case. So how does the Christian worldview, um, you know, do better at kind of responding to the problem of evil, damn karma and reincarnation? Right. I think we've partially answered that already in right. terms of God's personal nature. So a personal and perfectly moral God is administering the way the universe works and the way it turns out. So since God is all knowing and all powerful and all wise, God has plans that finite limited human beings do not know of. And we're told many times in scripture that God's ways are beyond finding out. So for example, I lost my first wife to dementia two and a half years ago. And it was a very long, sad story. I wrote about it in a book called Walking Through Twilight. Now, I can't say why God created a world that would include such terrible suffering. However, given my knowledge of the rational basis for Christianity as a worldview, I can trust God where I don't understand God. So it's not a blind leap of faith in the dark. It's like there's a framework of that apologetics gives us and talking to us through the Holy Spirit. I have a framework and within the framework, there are pockets of mystery and the unknown. But I can deal with those. I could even suffer well knowing the facts that God created a good world. It fell into sin, but he's in the process of redeeming it through the work of Jesus. So if we have good arguments for the existence of a creator, designer, lawgiver God, and if we believe the gospel message given to us in Scripture— that God himself, the second person of the Trinity, the Logos, came to us full of grace and truth, and he laid down his life for us on the cross to reconcile us to God and forgive our sin, then that gives a very deep moral meaning and significance to the world. And it allows me to live with my ignorance of many factors of life. But if Theism making more sense than pantheism or atheism or polytheism. And then I look at theism and I say, well, the basic options would be Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, or theistic forms of Hinduism. I say, well, let me think about a very influential monotheist named Jesus of Nazareth. (laughs) What about him? Who was he? You know, Jesus said, who do you say that I am? And that's the question that really echoes down through the ages. Who is Jesus Christ? And I'm convinced from the evidence and from 
45 years of following Jesus, that he is who he said he was. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He is worthy of worship because he is God incarnate. And he triumphed over sin and death and Satan and despair through his resurrection. And there's lots of evidence that he died, he was, and he rose again from the dead, and he showed himself to be such with men. So Jesus really singles himself out of the crowd of all the monotheists as a historical person, full story from the Old Testament into the New Testament and on till today. And so when I think about monotheism as the best supported worldview, I say, Jesus teaches me the deepest, highest, want to put it that way, form of monotheism, which is Christianity, which is God is one God, eternally existing in three persons. One of those persons came to earth to redeem those who would follow him in the person of Christ. And that's the good news. It's not through karma. It's not through good works, not through a mystical experience, but it's through the historical work of Christ and having faith in him, uh, lifting the empty hands of faith that we can be forgiven and reconciled to God. And that's the best story, the truest story, and the most rational story that I know of. Yes, how powerful is that? Because God himself, or Christ himself, coming down and participating in our suffering as a response to the problem of evil itself. Um, I think that is right. really, um, it, don't you think it, it's like the single factor, the big factor that differentiates, um, you know, the approach that Hinduism takes towards reaching to God or through that nirvana? Oh, I think so, because... Uh, God is a, a personal agent who knows everything and he assesses everything properly. And in light of that, in, even in spite of our sin and our rebellion against God, God chooses to come to redeem us. And he suffers the worst possible suffering because he was an innocent victim. He was perfectly righteous, but he exchanges his righteousness for our unrighteousness. So we can receive his righteousness as a gift and he takes on the penalty for our unrighteousness. And in Hinduism, you have this idea of an avatar, you know, a manifestation of, of God who comes once in a while, but no avatar is really historically grounded. There's no good evidence that these avatars even existed. Maybe there was a person named Krishna a long time ago, but they do not come and live perfect lives and work miracles and raise the dead and fulfill prophecies and go to a cruel and bloody death for the sins of the world. That is right. just not a part of Hinduism. So we want to point every Hindu, every Buddhist, every everybody to Christ and his achievements because they're unparalleled, they're matchless. Right. I mean, this is... Uh... This is something that, that doesn't even fit into the idea of karma, right? If you let, look at Jesus, and he's a perfectly righteous man, and mm. as per the idea of karma, he shouldn't be suffering that, right? But then you have this, yep. I think that just comes out of the boundaries of karma and what God did for us. Thank you for that brilliant explanation, by the way. Um, moving ahead, uh, you know, I've heard several, because you've also written extensively on the new age, Um First of all, why is I mean, why do you think there is an intersection between the new age, which is very popular in the West, I understand, and um, you know Hinduism or Buddhism? What really brings them together? And also, you know, I've I've heard uh, several proponents of such a worldview argue from apparent testimonies of people recalling their past lives through you know uh, hypnosis as evidence for re reincarnation. How do we explain and respond to these arguments? Right. Well, my first several books were about the New Age movement. And uh, one of them is still in print, maybe two of them, Unmasking the New Age, which came out in 1986. Uh, the New Age movement was kind of a novelty in America then. It's, it's very much mainstream now. So it takes elements from 
Eastern religions and also Western occultism and some aspects of human potential psychology and uh, rolls it together. But New Age thinking is pantheistic and non-dualistic typically and affirms reincarnation and karma. And it also sometimes tries to mix Jesus in, to make Jesus into a Swami or a guru or something like that. And, and certainly that doesn't fit the biblical testimony. I think a lot of New Age people perhaps have never actually heard or understood the gospel. And so they've given up on Christianity sometimes without even knowing what it actually is. So we need to be very clear with people what the gospel of Jesus is, be able to articulate that uh, very forcefully and lovely, lovingly with people. But some people think there's evidence for reincarnation. And one piece of evidence they use is that if you put someone uh, into a, a trance, if you hypnotize someone, they might be able to talk about their previous lives. And the first thing to say there is not everything that people say when they're hypnotized is true because hypnotism goes into the unconscious mind and there are a lot of things in the unconscious mind, films you've seen, dreams you've had, experiences you've had. And when you, you hypnotize them and say, well, tell us who you were be before you were born, someone might say something. They're not really talking about who they were before they were born. They're talking about the contents of their subconscious mind. So I don't take that to be good evidence at all. And then moreover, if the critique that I gave of non-dualistic pantheism combined with reincarnation is true, then there could be no possible evidence for reincarnation because reincarnation simply could not happen, you know, on that non-dualistic pantheistic worldview. But let's say you hold a view um, that there is a God who orchestrates and administrates reincarnation, then it would be possible that someone could have a memory of a previous life. But in my research over the years, I've never found good evidence for that. It, often it is fraud, like there was a case back in the 1950s in the U.S. called the Bridie Murphy case. That turned out to be extremely popular, but it was a fraud. Get from hypnosis is not reliable either. So I just don't see strong evidence from these kinds of things. It's a very romantic, appealing worldview. Uh, there was a proponent of the New Age movement who's very popular 20 or 30 years ago in the United States named Shirley MacLaine. She's an actress. And she would go on and on in her books about all the wondrous adventures she had in previous lifetimes. <laughs> it's like she gets to take her acting career into previous lifetimes. And, you know, it's an interesting story, but I just don't see the facts backing up that kind of thing. Lastly, this karmic cycle and the ultimate moksha is self-based, right? We've already discussed that the Christian truth of salvation is based on what Christ accomplished. I want you to give some, you know, practical tips while they're engaging with people from the karmic worldviews, how can they actually defend the sufficiency and necessity of the cross? Remember, you've already said that uh, the idea of avatars in Hinduism and these religions, but we are saying that once and for all, God comes down and deals with the issue or the problem of sin. How can we defend that position, articulate it? Yeah. Well, there are a number of things. First of all, Christians should pray for those people they're talking to, we should pray the Holy Spirit speaks through us and gives us the right words and the right attitudes and opportunities to communicate with others. Uh, Paul tells us that love is patient and kind. So when we're interacting with people, we need to listen to them, be patient. Um, often Christians are so excited about apologetics, they just give their arguments without listening to the worldview and the experiences of the person they're talking to. And we should not do that. We need to take people's experiences seriously and listen. And then we try to find points of contact. So a Hindu might say that Jesus was a spiritual master. Now, of course, the Hindu scriptures don't speak of Jesus at all. 
but taking a Hindu worldview, you might think that Jesus was like a yogi or a, a master, a guru. Now, he was way more than that, but if someone thinks that he was a sage, a wise man, then you can say, well, how do we know anything about Jesus? And I don't know what they would say, but you say, well, you know, we have these documents that were written by people who knew Jesus, like Matthew was a follower of Jesus, John was a follower of Jesus, or they consulted eyewitnesses, people who knew Jesus. And these are very well-established historical documents. And then we have the writing of the Apostle Paul about Jesus. And you might say, have you looked at these? Have you ever read any one of the four Gospels? And if people haven't, you could say, well, I think it's worth doing. If you want to be an educated person and you think there are about two billion people in the world that follow Jesus or claim to be Christians, uh, well, why don't you look into it a little bit? In fact, I had a conversation with two Americans last Christmas who were both Hindus and were both very deep into meditation. And one of them said, my guru says that Jesus was the greatest of all gurus. But he said, I don't really know very much about Jesus. Could you tell me about him? <laughs> what a wonderful opportunity. So I explained the problem of sin, that we've fallen short of the glory of God. The problem is within us that there's a personal God we've sinned against, and Jesus came as the mediator, the go-between, to show the love of God and the justice of God, that um, he took the penalty that we deserve so we could be accepted. And this man had never heard that. But his guru told him, and this was a guru from India, that Jesus was the greatest of all gurus. So there was just a wonderful opportunity and I think with a Hindu, we have to be really clear on how Christianity does not teach reincarnation and karma. It has a different understanding of the human condition, human problem, and the, the medicine, so to speak. Because all religions offer a medicine. Right. And Hinduism right. offers reincarnation and karma with the hope of nirvana or moksha. That's the medicine. And the medicine that we offer is, in a sense, the blood of Jesus Christ shed on the cross to atone for our sin. And the worldview that makes meaningful the death of Christ uh, is a rationally supported worldview. So you, the medicine has to fit reality. You know, there are a lot of medicines that will not cure you, and believing in karma and reincarnation and mystical experience will not atone for your sin. Only God himself in Christ provides the sacrifice that will atone for sin and give us eternal life, forgiveness of all sin and eternal life with God in a renewed creation. You see that in Revelation 20, 21, 22. It's really a glorious vision of life and it gives meaning to suffering and it also gives intellectual and that's why I'm a Christian and why I've been a Christian now for almost... Uh, 46 years. Right. Uh, while you were saying that, something that, you know, um, I think need to be uh, quickly addressed maybe, is that do you see that there are some commonalities between these worldviews? Because I've seen um, a lot of attempts that are made to borrow uh, some ideas from one religion to the other. And the, populariz the popularization of, let's say, Christian yoga, such, you know, practices of meditation, etc. Would you have a comment on that? Yeah, that's a really large question. Right. But if we're thinking about the relationship of religions, we have to understand what each religion really teaches and what it does not teach. So what people do often in America is they combine religions in ways that are illogical. So in the New Age movement, if you try to make Jesus into a guru or a yogi, or you say that he taught reincarnation, which some people do, that doesn't fit what Christianity actually teaches. Now, you can find truth, some truth, in every religion, uh, because God has made truth known through nature and through conscience. 
So we can find some truths in Hinduism, some basic moral truths. Certainly there's a sense of guilt and a sense that we need moral meaning and justice in the universe. There's at least that yearning for that in Hinduism. And we can say you find the fulfillment of that in scripture, in the teachings of Jesus. Uh, I've gone on record against something like Christian yoga. I think that's really a, a contradiction. You know, yoga is a way to try to find a mystical union with Brahman. So that's nothing that a Christian will want to do. That's the ultimate purpose of it. And a lot of Americans think it's just about stretching or about feeling better about your body or feeling peace. But the way I put it, if it's really yoga, really Hindu yoga, and you're thinking of the genuine Christianity, not a watered down version, then they don't, they don't fit together. Probably that, that's an inter interesting take on the subject. I really appreciate your time, Dr. Gotais. Before parting, I'd just like to ask you about your um, you know, your work, uh, Christian Apologetics, a comprehensive case for a Christian faith. I know that you are in the process of kind of updating it. Uh, what are the additional, let's say, chapters and, uh, I mean, uh, the arguments that you have? Right. Yeah, I have a, a, my desk here. My desk is very messy because I am revising the book, but you can see it's a, it's a pretty large book, 752 pages, but I have uh, two new chapters on the atoning work of Jesus, explaining that and defending that. I have a chapter on what's called original monotheism, that the historical evidence is pretty strong that the first religion was monotheism, not animism or polytheism. And I have a chapter on the argument from beauty, that there's objective beauty in the world that was put there by God, so that's evidence for God. And I have a, a short chapter that will come after my chapter on the problem of evil called Lament as Christian Apologetic. And by that I mean, I touched on it in our talk. I mean that because of the cross of Jesus, his suffering and death and resurrection, we can, as followers of Jesus, suffer well. We can suffer with hope. We can lament. We can call out to God and say, uh, Lord, this is so difficult. Hear my prayer. And there's so many psalms of lament in the scriptures, certainly about 60. So anyway, I'll add that and a few other things. So I may have an argument with my publisher how much, you know, how much thicker can I make this book? But uh, I would appreciate your prayers. I'm trying to finish that by the end of this calendar year. Really, really looking forward to that. And I think the additions themselves are worth, um, you know, it is kind of generating that curiosity already. Uh, I'm really looking forward to it. And if you are watching this again, you know, just, just as I mentioned at the start of the program, it's a book that you need to have on, on your shelf. It's a wonderful textbook for apologetics. Thank you, Dr. Gotais, for being with us today. It was really our pleasure and our joy to have you on our podcast. Well, you're welcome. You asked some excellent questions and I wish you well with your ministry. Thank you. Thank you so much.